Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Thanks. Now, a bit of unalloyed good news. At some point in our lives, very large numbers of us are going to suffer from some form of mental illness. Unlike many physical conditions, the treatment is often imprecise, hit and miss, trial and error. But tonight and later this week, our science editor, Susan Watts, brings news of medical developments which promise a revolution in the way many mental illnesses are treated and so literally may offer the promise of life over death. Just a warning that this film contains flash imagery. The statistics are shocking. One in four of us will suffer some form of mental illness during our lifetime. And mental illness costs lives. One in six people with bipolar disorder or manic depression will kill themselves. For decades, many of these conditions have been beyond our understanding. Treatments sometimes work, sometimes not. And in the more severe cases, we're still just locking people up. But now, scientists think we're on the verge of a revolution. We are really facing a tipping point here in where we are with the research on mental illness. And answers are being found by delving deep inside the brain. My first major suicide attempt was in 95. It's like this black hole. You convince your brain that you'd be better off dead because that darkness is, it's all encompassing. Neil Tinning, otherwise known as Twink, has been living with bipolar disorder for most of his okay. life. The drugs help him, but he never knows when he might have another serious and potentially deadly episode. The problem with, with a, a, a sufferer such as myself is you're introduced to a new medication regime and, and you always get that placebo effect that you think, oh, this time, this time it, it's going to work. And then four, four weeks down the road after you get the efficacy of the medication and it doesn't work and you have to come off that medication slowly because you can't do anything sudden, otherwise that could push you into an episode. Other meds in combination of meds and 16 years down the line after starting medication, I've got to a place where I'm relatively stable, but I always hate saying that because I never know what's going to happen tomorrow. But there could be hope for people like Twink. Scientists trying to understand mental disorders, such as serious depression, now have access to powerful new tools made possible by advances in science and technology. And by understanding the mechanisms of the brain, they're gaining an insight into our minds, changing what happens in the clinic. And this is what it's all about, the human brain. This one came from a healthy adult female. Scientists are beginning to understand how the brain works and what makes it go wrong. This is one of the key technologies giving scientists that fresh insight. The radiographer or the clinician would inject the subject and then one would actually record the uh, measurements that would emanate from the subject over a period of, maybe for these particular images, maybe an hour or so. Using the latest in brain scans, scientists have honed in on one region of the brain that becomes overactive in depression. It's called Area 25. It means they can actually see what's going wrong and which drugs work best. Already, these scanning technologies are having a real impact that could significantly improve the way patients are treated. In groundbreaking research seen by Newsnight, a London team taught computer software to recognise patterns in brain images. Those patterns predict which patients will go on to develop the most serious forms of psychosis. 
With this work, we're showing that when people come to us with our first episode of psychosis, we can, in fact, already distinguish the people that will do better from the people who will have a more severe type of illness course. And this will allow us to start thinking of using a different treatment uh, for these different groups of people. It's Professor Kapoor's job to analyse these results, and he thinks such developments could transform psychiatry. Up to now, our approach to mental disorders has been very much at a surface level. A psychiatrist or a psychologist will talk to you, try to understand your problems very deeply, but largely based on what you say and what your family members say about the condition, they would have to make up their mind about what the diagnosis was. There was no aid, if you may, from any clinical tests or laboratory tests or blood tests in a way that has been there for the last 50 years in the rest of medicine. So this is our first opportunity, really, to take psychiatric diagnosis beyond the descriptive to, in some sense, based in their deeper biology. But it's not just brain imaging that's bringing about this revolution. The battle is also being fought in the genetics lab. On chromosomes 10 and 12. The world's largest genetic study of people with bipolar disorder is taking place in Cardiff. Professor Nick Craddock is in charge. We're trying to identify genes and therefore molecules which were involved in bipolar disorder and that will give us a really clear and better understanding of some of the causes and triggers of bipolar disorder. One of his patients is Twink and he's returned to Cardiff to give the team an update on how he's been doing. Can you just tell us how things have been going over the last four years, Twink? Yeah, it's, um, I think I'm I'm starting to see the green shoots of getting better. The last four years have been challenging. Time's been desperate. Some of the genetic findings, typically from family studies, help us know how to um, identify people at very high risk of illness. And some of those things we already use in the clinic from day to day. We're already finding that some of the sorts of gene that seems to be important in susceptibility to bipolar disorder has a wider role and also increases susceptibility to things like schizophrenia or recurrent depression. Um, we're going to understand much better why people so often have a complex mix of different symptoms that don't easily fit into one diagnostic box. As scientists begin to unpick the workings of the brain, the challenge is to find new, more effective treatments. Until now, it's been pretty hit and miss, almost stumbling across drugs that happen to work. But with new tools such as brain scans and genetics, scientists are talking about a much more sophisticated approach, bringing the medicine of mental health out of the dark ages and into the 21st century. At the serene country retreat of Britain's National Academy of Sciences, Professor Insull is brainstorming with a select group of UK scientists. What you see is that it's not in any way... As head of a billion dollar agency in the States, his views carry some weight. Their task today, to come up with new ways to treat people. What's really intriguing is the development of new compounds. Uh, we have one as a sort of proof, proof of concept called ketamine, which works within three hours instead of requiring six weeks. Is that the same ketamine that's used as a horse tranquilizer? It's well known, it's been around for decades. It actually was selected because people thought that it affected a particular molecular target in the brain that seems to change after six weeks of treatment with conventional antidepressants. People said, OK, let's just jump over those six weeks and go right for that target. Ketamine itself couldn't be used. It's not safe long term and people relapse over a week or so. But it's just one example of how scientists are coming up with faster and more effective treatments. And it's that that's got them excited. This is a, a potentially deadly illness for which you would want to have treatments that don't take six to eight weeks to work. You'd like to have something that could work much more quickly. So this is a game changer in that sense. 
And it's that kind of advance that scientists hope will change the way we all think about mental illness. That this is not something that's all in the mind from which people should just pull themselves together. Their hope is that mental illness will one day become just like any other field of medicine. What I would foresee is over the next generation, we will move to a situation where psychiatry is much more like cardiology or other medical specialties, where we have a range of tests, um, imaging tests of the way the brain functions, blood tests to know about susceptibility factors, um, other sorts of psychological tests that will really help direct us to the diagnosis and crucially will enable us to know much more accurately how to help people. And for Twink, that's the real promise of this revolution. 3,000 people this week will attempt suicide. Now, I'm not saying all of those 3,000 are bipolar sufferers, but a large proportion of them will have some mental ill health. And if we can do something about that, then we can save lives. And it's as black and white as that. Scientists aren't saying that knowing where something's happening inside the brain, or even what's happening, will answer all our questions about mental illness. But with these new tools, science is transforming our approach. And for many people, that will be the difference between life and death. <laughs>